Hello, my lovely scholars and saints. It is Sunday where I am, about 3 p.m. I'm taking a break from my reading of uh, Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy, which I am absolutely loving. It's so inspiring, so interesting. I know it's one of his early works, and I find that it is uh, a bit referential to Plato and Hegel, which I find interesting, and I don't know if he continues those sort of like um, alignments later on in his works. I've read a lot of uh, about five books in his sort of like middle historical period, and so this is the the first one in the beginning period and then I haven't read really anything in the uh, last period except I am reading Will to Power but that I can't remember the range of uh, years that, that uh, encompasses so uh, I'm on spring break pretty much still a paper screen but I uh, need some help <laughs> being motivated to basically reread this first essay of Nietzsche's On the Genealogy of Morals. Um, I did a video over the preface, but this is what we are to read in part when we get back from spring break. So I think we're also maybe discussing maybe the beginning of the second essay although I'm sure my classmates will read it because they all seem to have already read the first essay. So, um, and a lot of times when I have to reread something for class, it's kind of difficult for me because um, as one of you have said, there's just so little time <laughs> to read books and I gravitate toward books that I haven't read before. Sometimes I like to reread, but it just depends. All right, so this first essay is called Good and Evil, Good and Bad, and he's starting off talking about psychology. These English psychologists to whom we are indebted for having alone endeavored to provide a historical account of the origin of morality, these men themselves, I say, present to us a bit of a riddle. I must confess that they even have as living riddles an advantage over their books. They themselves are interesting. So it sounds like Nietzsche wants to psychologize the psychologist. These English psychologists, what do they really want? They are always found at work, whether intentionally or unintentionally, pushing the partie hontus, which means the shameful part, of our inner world to the foreground and looking for the active governing and decisive principle precisely where our race, so proud of our intellectual advancement, would be most embarrassed to find it, for example, in the visinerche of habit or in forgetfulness or in a blind and accidental mechanism and association of ideas or in some factor that is purely passive, automatic, reflexive, molecular, or fundamentally mindless. What is it that always drives these psychologists in precisely this direction? That was a long sentence. We are not in aphorism land with Nietzsche. I think this is really interesting, especially, um, you know, he is quite before the advances today of the mind-body connection and, you know, looking at the importance of the subconscious, even this idea of the superconscious, and how it affects, um, you know, our bodies in ways we may not be conscious of. So I find his critique slightly dative, dated because this is what he's critiquing the psychologist as doing. You know, and I think of like Freud, for instance, uh, they were pretty, Nietzsche and Freud were pretty concurrent historically. Nietzsche was born 1844, Freud was boi born 1856. I don't know why I'm having trouble with words today. Sorry, I think it's like anxiety in general. But um, so, you know, and you think about Freud that 
everything, I don't know if this necessarily started with him, but a lot of our maybe neuroticisms or difficulties in relationships, etc. as adults, you know, he wanted to look at the like a, the very beginnings of our childhood experiences and look at, you know, compare good sort of healthy development with a development where we got stuck at a certain stage and I think his like he emphasizes the sexual in the development. I've read some of Freud. I really liked Civilization and its discontents and I've read I think the ego and the id and maybe one other book but I'd like to go back to Freud and uh, so uh, maybe he is I think basically what Nietzsche is saying here though is that our challenges our neuroticisms actually live more toward the surface and our part and parcel of cultural societal specifically religious influences and if we could just shed those chains and maybe by questioning them questioning the taken for grantedness of them we'd kind of easily be cured so we don't need to necessarily uh, delve into the recesses of the unconscious is it an instinct for belittling our race, somewhat sinister, vulgar, and malignant, or perhaps incomprehensible even to itself? Or perhaps a touch of suspicion born of pessimism? Nietzsche has a really interesting relationship to pessimism, I think. The mistrust of delusioned idealists who have become gloomy, poisoned, and bitter. So I think that you know, maybe he's finding psychology a bit fatalistic. Or a petty enmity and rancor against Christianity and Plato, which may have never crossed the threshold of consciousness. Or just a vicious taste for those elements of life which are bizarre, painfully paradoxical, mystical, and illogical. So I highlighted that in my book. Because Nietzsche, in many of his works, Sort of, I was reading Daybreak, um, and I think I came across this idea in that work, where he's saying that we shouldn't try to, it's not honorable to repress the unconventional, because the unconventional might be what saves you and humanity. So, you know, Nietzsche wants to really ask what values and when are actually healthy for the human being. Health for Nietzsche being, you know, um, self-assurance, confidence, survival. Um, you know, he has somewhat of an alignment with Darwin, but he takes a more historical rather than a natural kind of understanding of I guess, um, virtues and vices. I think for Nietzsche, it's, it's easier to get on the right track. So I think that he finds value in like this list, this descriptive list, maybe something bizarre, maybe something painfully paradoxical, mystical, illogical, maybe even evil um, is actually not something we should bring out of the shadows and tame and transform, but they have value in and of themselves. Or as a final alternative, a dash of each of these motives, a little vulgarity, a little gloominess, a little anti-Christianity, a little craving for the necessary piquancy. But I am told that it is simply a case of old, cold, boring frogs crawling and hopping into and around men. He's so poetic sometimes. As if they were in their element, the swamp. I am disinclined to listen to this. Indeed, I should say I do not believe it. 
And if I may be permitted to hope, given the impossibility of knowledge, I hope most earnestly that just the reverse is true, and that these analysts or analysts, sorry, with their psychological microscopes should be truly brave, proud, and magnanimous animals who know how to keep both their emotions and their pain in check and have specifically trained themselves to sacrifice what is desirable to what is true. Any truth, in fact, even the simple, bitter, ugly, repulsive, unchristian, and immoral truth, for there are such truths. So I think that Nietzsche sees psychology and science as a whole, psychologists and scientists as a whole, as being distracted by their own fears and desires you know maybe a fear that human beings are naturally like bad and violent and vicious and the desire for human beings to be good and they're just you know a little broken and need to be fixed and Nietzsche you know wants to I guess infuse science and psychology with a little more courage and dare to not be held back by their own sort of neuroticisms, I guess. So this is the second section. Let us honor then the noble sentiments which would dominate these historians of morality. I mean, I guess if you're trying, if you're an analyst and you're trying to sort of fix a client, then what's it called? Like, they call the analysis and I don't know. Um, then you would fix them to raise them up according to maybe the status quo standard of what is normal or what is good or what is appropriate. But Nietzsche is very suspicious of conforming to status quo morality and conventions. I think that he wants to create space for the potential liberation via the rebel or the renegade. But it is certainly a shame, so this is what is the shame, that they, and what we should be ashamed of, perhaps, that they lack the historical sense itself, that they themselves have been abandoned by all the beneficent spirits of history. In accordance with the long-established custom among philosophers, all of their thought runs on thoroughly unhistorical lines. And I was reading in The Birth of Tragedy that um, he says that religion dies when we want to reify the mythological into history. And I was thinking, like, for instance, looking at Christ as a historical figure because that makes him real with a capital R and allows us to, you know, put belief in certainty instead of maybe looking at Christ and the crucifixion, etc., in a, in a mythical and symbolic and metaphorical way. Because when we do, then we leave, the, we, we leave that content, that mythological content, up for growth and depth and expansion. There is no doubt on this point. The gross ineptitude of their genealogy of morals is immediately apparent when they have to explain the origin and development of a concept and judgment good. According to their decree, selfless acts were originally lauded and called good by their benef sorry. <laughs> beneficiaries, those to whom they were useful Subsequently, this fact was forgotten, and selfless acts, which had for so long been habitually praised as good, came also to be felt as good, as though they were intrinsically good. The thing is immediately obvious. 
This initial derivation already contains all the typical and idiosyncratic traits of the English psychologists. We have utility, forgetting, habit, and finally error, the whole assemblage forming the basis of a system of values on which the higher man has to, has up to the present, prided himself, as though it were a kind of universal human privilege. This feeling of pride must be undone, likewise with this system of values. Has that been achieved? So I, I can't remember who it was. Maybe Bentham who talks, who equates the good with what is useful and practical. And it's interesting to, you know, get Nietzsche's perspective of this. Um, because I really think that that's kind of a valid way to think like what we or the idea that we call what's pleasurable good and what's painful bad you know I guess Nietzsche would disagree with with that specifically because some like if you look at his understanding of like maybe the heroic noble personality were willing to sacrifice the self painfully in order to self overcome what is that quote one of my exes used to always have it on his email something about the unreasonable man like making history or something What first comes to my mind is that in this theory, the origin of the concept of good was mistakenly identified and thus sought in vain, for the judgment good did not originate among those to whom goodness was shown. Rather, it has been the good men themselves, that is, no, the noble, the powerful, those of high degree, so Nietzsche loves the powerful, right? Like his book, The Will to Power, as it is titled, the high-minded who have felt that they themselves were good, so we're taking it upon ourselves to identify what is good, individually, perhaps, and that their actions were good, that is to say, of the first order, as opposed to all the low, the low-minded, the vulgar, and the plebeian, the herd of the masses. It was from this pathos of distance that they first claim the right to create values for their own benefit and to coin the names of such values. What did they have to do with utility? The standpoint of, so maybe, well, I'll, I'll wait to say that. The standpoint of utility is as alien and inapplicable as it could possibly be when we have to deal with such a fierce eruption of supreme values, creating and demarcating as they do a hierarchy within themselves, it is here that one arrives at an appreciation of the contrast to that tepid temperature, which is the presupposition upon which every calculation of prudence or expediency is always based. And not for one occasion, not for one exceptional instance, but for the duration the pathos of nobility and distance, as I have said, the continuing and dominating collective instinct and feeling of superiority of a higher race, a master race, in comparison to a subservient race, this is the origin of the opposition of good and bad. So when he talks about distance twice here, like the pathos, the pathos, the tragedy of distance, I know there is this maybe idea that Nietzsche feels it's valid to distance oneself from like the sick and the weak in a sense, um, which is a, quite a, a stoic and also maybe a platonic idea 
you know, to let what needs to die, die, which sounds terrifying when you're talking about like human beings. But I think it was in the Republic where Plato said, you know, um, doctors shouldn't spend all of their time trying to keep the truly sick alive. (laughs) That just sounds so horrible, but you know, tough love, I guess. (laughs) So I don't know if that's what Nietzsche is saying right here about um, the pathos of distance, but we'll see. The master's right of naming extends so far that it is permissible to look upon language itself as the expression of the power of the masters. They say this is that and that. They affix a seal to every object and every event with a sound and thus, as it were, to take ownership of it. It is by virtue of this origin that the word good is far from having any necessary connection with selfless acts in accordance with the superstitious belief of these moral philosophers. On the contrary, it is only on the occasion of the decay of aristocratic values that the opposition between egoistic and selfless impresses itself more and more intently upon the human conscience. It is, to use my own language, the herd instinct, which ultimately finds its expression in this opposition. And even then, it takes a considerable time for this instinct to become sufficiently dominant so that the value can become inextricably dependent on this opposition, as is the case in contemporary Europe. For today, the prejudice which, acting even now with all the intensity of an obsession and mental illness, holds up moral, selfless, and disinteresse are concepts of equal value is already prevalent. So is he saying that the origin of the opposition of good and bad is basically the opposition of the strong versus the weak and that because there are more, he sees like the herd instinct as kind of creating weak people, like the masses of the non-courageous that it was the non-courageous masses that decided what the good was and set up you know sort of like Hegel's historic world world historical man or Rand's you know idea of like the few I guess you wouldn't say like capitalists who can like move forward and progress the world with their technology um So the few that Nietzsche and Rand and Hegel would admire, they didn't get to say, they didn't get to define what good was. I think so. Let me know. In this, this is section three. In the second place, quite apart from the fact that this hypothesis regarding the genesis of the judgment good cannot be considered historically tenable, it suffers from an inherent psychological contradiction. The high regard in which altruistic conduct, every time I see the word altruistic, I think of Ayn Rand now, (laughs) is held, is supposed to lie in its utility. And we are asked to believe that this has been forgotten. But in what conceivable way is this forgetting even possible? Has the utility of such conduct perhaps ceased all at once? The contrary is the case. This utility is experienced every day at all times and is something that is continually confirmed anew. It follows that rather than vanishing from consciousness and memory, it must be impressed on the consciousness with with ever greater vividness How much more reasonable, then, is that opposing theory, which for all that is not the truer one, which is proposed, for instance, by Herbert Spencer, who maintains that the concept good is all but identical to the concept useful, practical, so that in the judgments good and bad, man is simply summarizing and sanctioning his unforgotten and unforgettable experiences concerning the useful practical and the harmful practical impractical the harmful impractical according to this theory good is that which has previously demonstrated usefulness and thus it may claim to be considered valuable in the highest degree 
valuable in itself. This method of explanation is also, as I have said, wrong, but at any rate, the explanation itself is coherent and psychologically tenable. Okay, so, you know, he says that, like, he understands how someone would come to the idea that the good is the pleasurable or the good is the practical. I mean, I guess he doesn't mention pleasure and pain, but I think it, he could. <laughs> it definitely relates. Um, yeah, that's just not how he would define the good, because I think for him, the good is not always pleasurable and the good is not always practical. All right, section four. What put for what first put me on the right track was this question. So with Nietzsche, it's always about the question. The question is the gateway to liberating ourselves from status quo chains. The art of the question. He could have like written an essay with that title. What is the true etymological meaning of the various terms for the idea good, which have been coined in various languages? I then found that they all led back to the same evolution of the same idea, that everywhere aristocrat, noble in the social sense, is the root idea out of which have necessarily developed good in the sense of with aristocratic soul, noble in the sense of with a noble soul, with a privileged soul, a development which invariably runs parallel with that other evolution in which vulgar, plebeian, low are transformed finally into bad. The aptest example of this last contention is the German word schlecht itself. This word is identical with schlicht. Uh, so comparing bad with simple. He says, compare Schlechtweg and Schlechterdings. That's probably not how you pronounce it. I'm studying German, but kind of let Duolingo go. Duolingo was harassing me a little bit in my email, but that's fine. It's, you know, the little owl has my best interest in mind. I get which originally and simply, is it like a T sound? Schlechter things? No, that's not even a German accent. <laughs> like, okay, I'm going to move on. Which originally and simply denoted the simple common man in contrast to the aristocratic man without any sinister implication. So I guess Nietzsche is for the aristocratic soul, or at least he sees that as a more valid connection to the good. Like he doesn't, he doesn't feel ashamed of, I guess, privilege, privilege or aristocracy to some extent, maybe. It is at the rather late period of the Thirty Years' War that this sense changed to the sense now current. From the standpoint of the genealogy of morals, this discovery seems to be substantial. That it was only recently discovered must that it was only recently discovered must be attributed to the suppression of all questions of origin due to the democratic prejudice in the modern world. See, I guess he's still in this very middle mid Nietzschean book, still kind of platonic, because Plato, you know, he was all about the philosopher kings and making the best of the best be the rulers of the world, and he hated democracy. <laughs> so this, ex this extends, as will shortly be shown, even to the province of natural science and physiology, which to all appearances is the most objective. The extent of the mischief which can be caused by this prejudice, once it grows to the point of hatred, particularly to morality and history, is shown by the notorious case of Buckle. It was in, and there's a footnote, it was in Buckle that the plebeianism of the modern spirit, which is of English origin, erupted once again, 
upon its native soil with all of the violence of a volcano of mud. And with that salted, stentorian, and vulgar eloquence with which to the present time all volcanoes have spoken. So section five starts out by saying, with regard to our problem, which for good reasons can be called a confidential problem and can be disclosed only to a select few, it is of not inconsiderable interest that in those words and roots which denote good, we catch glimpses of that distinctive trait which the noble field distinguishes them and which exalts them above their fellows. Indeed, in most instances, they simply call themselves the powerful, the lords, the commanders, in accordance with their superior power or with the most obvious sign of their superiority, as, for example, the rich, the owners. That is, me that is the meaning of Arya, so a Sanskrit term. The Iranian and Slav languages have corresponding forms. So basically what he says in the section, which I'm not going to continue to read because it is one of the sort of problematic sections, I think, due to the examples that he uses. But he is basically... He's ending the section by saying, must not our actual German word gut mean the godlike, the man of the godlike race? So he's trying to draw an etymological connection between the German word for good and the German word for God. And uh, this is where perhaps, uh, you know, misreadings have been made of Nietzsche by historical terrible people, dictators, etc., th uh, thinking that Nietzsche is like a, I don't know, like in alignment with their sort of ideology. My professor said last week that, you know, I think we could say that Nietzsche would not support some of those like historically horrific movements um, headed by people, different dictators, because for Nietzsche, what is godlike, what is powerful is something very specific, you know, that you will get as you read him something that has to do with survival, with self-sacrifice, with self-overcoming. And uh, I think he distinguishes between like the many and the few because he just maybe is skeptical that he doesn't see most people rising up to this occasion, which he sees himself as a part of. But it's to also, so if you were going to self-overcome, you have to retain self-criticism. And so it's not like a carte blanche of justification for one's own superiority or a particular people's superiority. It's more about the the logical, what logically makes sense to endorse characteristics and virtues and values and personality traits and ways of being and decisions that can be rationally argued. For instance, it would be Good, the good, the, what is the good in a situation where you have to decide between sacrificing yourself for the comfort of someone else? Let's say your parent wants you to, I don't know, be a doctor. And I'm just going to use like a really cliche example. But you want to be a philosopher um, but you're gonna sacrifice the good of your happiness your passion what you see as being truly contribute 
contributive to the world just to make your mother happy. So you're going to basically be miserable for the rest of your life to please your mother or parent or whoever it is. And so he would say that, no, it's actually good. The real good is to honor one's own passions and what even if it's you know not in like celebrated by the status quo or by your family etc it's to not conform it's to stand your ground be strong even if your parent cries and is mad and says you're stupid and you know tries to bully you like you will then remove yourself create a boundary and remove yourself from that parent that's acting rather toxically and it is in that case like it is the bad like it is not good to honor thy parents like what does honoring thy parents mean um so so yeah so that's that's what i would say because nietzsche does for sure have some problematic in terms of like racist and sexist um sort of examples and language and yeah rhetoric i guess you could just summarize it as but overall you know i think his message is something akin to what ayn rand's message is at times like maybe taken to the extreme ayn rand is uh you know you can't take everything that she says but the the essence if you take the essence of it logically um then it can be helpful i don't know i just think ayn rand would really like nature in a sense the way he talks about status quo virtues like altruism and selfishness etc so i don't know so tell me what you think um sorry that i'm not going to read section five you can read it uh i will continue on with section six next time thanks everyone